If you will, open your Bibles to Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1. This will be our scripture reading. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also shall not wither, and wherever he and whatever he does, he shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Again, good morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We will get there in just a few minutes. This morning we are uh, wrapping up a series that we've been talking about the last several weeks, asking the question, how, are our, how is our family going to make it to heaven? Uh, not so much concerned about your mom or your dad or your children or your grandparents or your grandchildren, though that, of course, is important and something that we all care about, but, but really asking for us here at Charlotte Avenue, and if you are a, a member of the Lord's Church, asking for you as well, how is our family going to make it to heaven? How's God's family going to make it to heaven? We know that God's going to do everything and is doing everything within His power to make that happen, but what are we doing? Or do we owe anything to one another to make sure that we help each other on this journey to this place that all of us are trying to get? We've looked at a couple of different things, and this morning I want us to look at the idea of a threefold cord. A passage that you're familiar with, at least a terminology, a phrase, if you will, that you are familiar with. But let's consider these things. And when we think about our, our path to heaven, it is possible, I suppose, it is possible, I believe, to make it to heaven by yourself. Uh, to be a Christian alone somewhere out in the world and to never meet another Christian, I suppose it's possible to follow the Word of God completely on your own. I believe that if you were to do that and you were completely on your own, that you'd make it to heaven. However, I believe that most of the time, perhaps all the time in Scripture, when someone as a follower of God believes that they're wrong, God doesn't say, excuse me, believes that they're alone. God doesn't say, you're right, you're alone, but you've still got to be faithful. No, instead he points to them and says, no, you're not alone. I'm with you. And not only am I with you, but there are others around this world. And there perhaps are even others within the city that they were living in at the time when he is talking to them. And he says, I still have people here. There are still people who are faithful to, to me. And he encourages them by telling them not that they have to be remain faithful despite, and, and because they're alone or in spite of the fact that they're alone, alone. But instead he tells them, you're not alone. And you don't need to be alone. And you don't need to think about being alone. Instead, take comfort in the fact that I am with you and that you have others who are right alongside you. You can complete this phrase that we'll get to here in just a second in Psalm chapter 1 that William read to us. Here are some, some points that I, I take away from this. Basically, two points. Uh, an intimate camaraderie with the wicked is a perishing pathway. Uh, all of us have to interact with and, uh, and be around people who are not faithful regularly. Uh, we live in a world where the majority of the people in this world, that it has always been this way and will always be this way. Most people aren't interested in following Jesus, or even if they are interested in, perhaps they're not faithful in following Jesus. So intimate camaraderie with them, however, or a deep personal relationship with them where, where they are influencing us, perhaps, and especially more than we're influencing them. That kind of relationship with worldly people will lead us down a perishing pathway. However, communion abiding with a relationship with the Lord, and let me say also his people and his word will lead to abundant life. I believe that's what Psalm 1 teaches in essence. Again, all of us can complete this phrase in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, bad company corrupts good morals. 
We, we recognize the fact that Scripture teaches, and we recognize the fact from, from our life that when we hang around people that do things that, that aren't quite as godly as we know we need to be living, we're more likely to live ungodly lives and follow the crowd. And we also probably know that when we spend time around other people who are striving to live godly lives, not perfect people because none of us are perfect, but people whose goal and aim and focus is Let's, let, me, let me live like God and let me help other people around me live like God. When we spend time around people like that, it's easier for us to live that, that kind of life, to live a godly life. We recognize the, the value in that. In Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, the writer puts it this way. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. Again, that's, that's true in every aspect of life. That's true in your business life. Uh, if you're trying to, uh, to you know, go up the corporate ladder, then you need to spend time with wise people in your given job. And they're going to help you go up that ladder more than likely. If you spend time with foolish people in your job, they're not going to help you at all. You're going to suffer harm because you would spend time with them. That's true in our family. That's true in our communities. And certainly that's true spiritually. Uh, there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians. There are a lot of people who claim to love God. But we recognize and we understand that the, the simple fact that Jesus teaches in John 14, 15, if you love me, what? You will keep my commandments. The wise person spiritually not only declares their love for God, but demonstrates their love for God through the obedience to his word. Many people will say, I love Jesus, but won't show that through their actions. Who are we hanging out with? Who are we spending time with? Who do we have that intimate camaraderie with, that brotherhood? Who do we consider our brothers and sisters? Who do we look to the most? In the book of Ecclesiastes, if you want to turn there, if you're not there already, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 through 7. Uh, you know, the book of Ecclesiastes, the, Solomon, the, the writer of the book, he, he says at the, the very beginning of the book and really throughout that uh, we know that Solomon's the wisest man and he endeavors to understand everything. He endeavors to understand things uh, of, of, of folly, uh, of, of fun, and of, um, you know, just, just freedom. Uh, he understands to, to have great wisdom. He, he strives to understand, to, to know everything there is about life. And, and he doesn't do it just through simple observation of other people. Instead, he does it through participating in those things himself. And we know in the end, he comes to the conclusion uh, that we need to fear God and keep his commandments. That's what, what tells us at the end of Ecclesiastes. Uh, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, he's talking about specifically in verse 4 through 7, the vanity uh, of labor. Uh, in, in essence, he's saying that the, the things that we, we work so hard for, uh, we can't take with us. He also says the one who doesn't work is going to suffer harm. But then what I really want us to focus on as we think about this threefold chord idea today is verses 8 through 12. Look at Ecclesiastes 4, 8 through 12. There was a certain man without a dependent, having neither a son nor a brother, Yet there was no end to all of his labor. Indeed, his eyes were not satisfied with riches, and he never asked, And for whom am I laboring and, de and depriving myself of pleasure? This too is vanity, and it is a grievous task. Verse 9, Two are better than one, because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warmed alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A, co a cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Again, true in many aspects of life. But when we think spiritually, the importance of, of having someone else that depends on us, having someone else that we can share the valuable lessons that we've learned with, learned throughout our lives with, someone that we can have a, a relationship with so that we can, we can share the load and bear one another's burdens. All of these things are, are blessings that we can experience. Notice he says that the one who uh, was working so much and he had no son, he had no brother, he, he had no one to share his great wealth with, he, he wasn't taking pleasure in anything. It says at the end of that, that was, that was vanity, that was chasing after the wind. It was a grievous task. But companionship, what does companionship provide? A good return, a helping hand, comfort in difficulty, and protection in affliction. When we think about the church today, there are many in our world today and, and over the last several decades, and maybe this is a, an idea that has, has been within folks' minds over you know, forever, I guess, but certainly has become more prevalent is this idea of I can be a religious person and I don't need the church. 
I don't need to, to, to be a part of organized religion. Is there a need for the church today? May, perhaps even this morning there are those who, who are here regularly or maybe some of our visitors, our guests, who, who might have a similar thought. That they have a relationship with God, but they don't need a relationship with other people because why? And what's the temptation there? Because people let us down, don't they? Is that true? Absolutely, it's true. People will let us down all the time, and that's, that's something that happens frequently. But is there a need for the church today? Turn to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, and let's look at what it says about the, the purpose and the role and the importance of the church itself. Ephesians chapter 3, and verses 4 through 11 especially, especially is talking about a hidden mystery. Uh, a mystery that Paul and, and now the church is able to proclaim and, and are to proclaim. We'll look at verses 10 and 11 here specifically in a minute. But the, the job of the church is to proclaim this, this hidden mystery that for, for ages past... God has, has hidden from mankind, but now through Jesus has revealed to mankind. And in essence, the, the, really the, the mystery is something that you and I take for granted so much today. That anyone and everyone can be saved. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, a man or a woman, black or white or whatever else you might be. Anyone and everyone, God wants to be saved. Previous to Jesus coming, that was not the thought process. The Jews were the chosen people of God, and you can become a Jew but you had to do things their way. You had to become a proselyte. You had to live a Jewish type of lifestyle in order to be saved. But through Jesus, none of us have to do that anymore. Now we simply have to follow Jesus and become Christians. And notice what it says in verses 10 and 11 of Ephesians chapter 3. He says, so that the manifold wisdom of God, this mystery that's been hidden but now is known, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Two things that I think are important there. But from verse 10, he says it's the church's job. It is the church's job to declare this mystery that's no longer a mystery. It's the church's job to, to declare to the world, to those in heavenly places, those, those in high and, and, and lofty places, and to everyone else. It's our job as the church, as Christians, to declare this great mystery, the manifold wisdom of God. And then in verse 11 he says, this is in accordance with his eternal purpose. What that means is that not only was Jesus a part of his plan before the beginning of time, but also so was the church. It was God's plan before the beginning of time for there to be a church. For there to be a body of Christ and for that body of Christ to have the role and the job and the responsibility and the privilege to tell people about Jesus. Is the church important? Do we need the church? God thought so. God established it because he thought it was important. God established it because he had a big job for us as Christians to do. In Ephesians chapter 4, it goes on to, to describe some other things about the church. Look at verses 11 through 16 of Ephesians chapter 4, talking about uh, different people and different talents and different uh, even positions within the church. Notice some of the things that he says here in verse, uh, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he, God, gave some as apostles. Okay, I want to stop there for just a second. Uh, as we read especially verse 11, but as we go through this, I want you to look for yourself. Look for you. Uh, as we read these verses, he's going to talk about some, some people and some positions and some, some, some places where uh, the church needs these people. I want you to look for yourself. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and some as teachers. Why did he give us those things? Why did he give us those people? Verse 12, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. He's saying there, he gave these people to do these things so that the body of Christ, the church, might be everything that it needs to be. Verse 14, as a result... Because we can grow and come into this image of Christ, we can be like Christ as the body of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be like children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. He says, through our knowledge and our, our growth in Jesus, we can know we have a relationship with Christ. We can know we're saved in Christ Jesus. And when someone comes to us with a different idea, we can say, no, that's, that's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. That's not what God delivered to us. Here, let me show you what Scripture says. Verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, all of us as Christians, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself 
in love. Did you see yourself in there? Now, when we think about specific avenues, you look at verse 11 and you say, well, I'm not an apostle. None of us are. I'm not a prophet. None of us are today. I'm not an evangelist. Perhaps some of us are that. Pastors are elders or pastors. Teachers, or perhaps some of us are teachers. But you may look at that list there and say, Andy, I, you told me to look for myself and I, I didn't see myself there. And perhaps you didn't. But look at verse 16. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. You're there. You're one of those joints. You're one of those ligaments. You're one of those parts. This morning, brothers and sisters, if you're a Christian, you're important to this body. You're important to Charlotte Avenue. You're important to the church as a whole. You play a role, a significant role, an important role in whether or not the church will be everything Jesus would have us to be. Are you doing your part? Are you fulfilling that role? On Friday afternoon, I went to Augusta, Georgia, and I attended a funeral for a man named Nelson Saford. Uh, some of you have met Nelson before. He's been here for ECEC before, uh, but he's not extremely well known. You probably, many of us, most of us have probably never heard that name before, never met him before. Uh, he died at 70 years old. And we spent two hours celebrating this man. That's a pretty long funeral in my, in my experience, two hours. And, and there was uh, songs that we sang that were beautiful songs. And there were prayers that were prayed that were encouraging and comforting. But there were dozens, dozens upon dozens of different young people and people who once were young people but now weren't so young that would get up and speak about who Nelson was and what Nelson meant, for him, meant to them. There were those in their 50s who had known Nelson when he was much younger. He died at 70 years old again. Uh, and, and they spoke about how he was a friend and how he was a, a, a comfort and how he was someone who uh, was a companion for them. There were those in their 40s who would speak and say similar things. There were those in the 30s. And there was one specifically, a 25-year-old. And think about this, a 70-year-old man who just died. A 25-year-old man said, he was my best friend. You don't see that very much in the world today. You don't see that very much in the church today. There were teenagers that were there whose lives had been changed because this man had took the time to invest in them. I've known Nelson for probably 10 years or so. Uh, but I don't know him well. I never knew him extremely well. Uh, but I was asked by, by Jeremy, the, the minister who was there, who was performing the, the funeral, to, to write some things about him. And I want to read to you just briefly what, what I wrote about Nelson, not because my words are so beautiful, but because I hope that if you didn't see yourself in verse 11 of Ephesians chapter 4, maybe you can take, see yourself in verse 16 and see yourself through Nelson's example uh, and the, the simple life that he lived. In Exodus 17... We see a recently delivered Israel led by miracle worker Moses. By his side is his mouthpiece and, his, and God's high priest, his brother Aaron. Brave Joshua is the leader of the Israelite army and will lead them into the fray as, they, as these newly freed slaves are forced to fight for their lives against the Amalekites. Moses stands atop a nearby hill to, to survey the battle. However, he is no mere bystander, no. Moses, through the power of God, affects the battle below. Through God's might, as Moses raises his hands, Joshua and the army prevail. However, his hands grew weary, his arms lost strength, and his hands fell, leading, the enemy, leading to the enemy gaining the edge in the battle against the Israelites. Joshua was brave, willing to go into battle. Aaron was well-spoken and a strong spiritual leader, no doubt prayerful to God in these moments. Moses had the ability to turn the tide of the, uh, of the battle in favor of God's people. On this day, thousands of years ago, there was an otherwise unsung hero that saved the day, a man named Hur, perhaps well-known in his day, but known to far fewer today, took his stand alongside Mo Aaron and supported the arms of Moses. As Moses' hands reached towards the sky, seeking God's protection and provision, in this moment of great need, God provides and the Israelites overwhelmed their enemies in victory. Nelson was a man like her. Others may have, but I never heard Nelson deliver a sermon or teach a Bible class. I never experienced him leading a congregation in thoughts before the partaking of the communion or in singing a hymn. I never personally witnessed Nelson making a strong stand against false teaching or sitting down with someone to show them the gospel plan of salvation. He may have and probably did some of these things. 
but I never got the chance to personally see him in these circumstances. However, time and time again, I saw Nelson take a stand beside others and support them. Countless times he would stand alongside Jeremy and later Sam and support them in leading the Central Youth Group. I know of countless young men that he would invest in and in so doing would change the outcome of the battles that they were facing. From Exposure Youth Camp to the Spring Youth Rally at PBC, from SOAR to ECEC, Nelson has been a stalwart servant to many who would, take, who would take a more prominent position. I never heard him complain, though I'm sure there would have been things that he might have done differently. I never witnessed him look weary, though through the long nights and great concern, his eyes must have become blurry. Nelson Safer was not a perfect man. None of us are. But if we all had a servant's heart like his... We would enrich the lives of those around us, as Nelson did for so many of us during his time on this earth. The best compliment that can be given a Christian comes from Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, where it says, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And today, we glorify God for his servant Nelson. Again, Nelson, in my experience, never did anything up front. Never wanted to or sought the spotlight but changed the lives of countless people because he invested in them brothers and sisters we must do the same nelson has made more of an impact as a servant of god than i've made as a preacher of the gospel why because more than likely a couple months down the road you're not going to remember this lesson but if someone would invest in your life spiritually regularly you would remember them you may not remember a specific lesson or a specific word that they might teach you or say to you but you will remember the relationship that you had with them and how that relationship encouraged you to have a relationship with god brothers and sisters you may not be a pastor you aren't certainly a, an apostle or a or a, a prophet but you can be a brother or a sister in christ and that is what we need in order to make it to heaven Turn to Galatians chapter 6, just a couple pages back in your Bibles. Galatians chapter 6, let's read verses 1 through 10. Make some final points, and the lesson will be yours. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brethren, if anyone among you is caught in a trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have a reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one must bear his own load. The one who is taught the word is to share, with all, to share all things with the one who teaches him. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to his spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So then, while we have opportunity, let's do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. That's the opportunity that you and I have. How, how is this family here at Charlotte Avenue, how are the Christians in this room going to make it to heaven? Primarily, and most of all, they're going to make it because of the grace of God. That's why anyone will make it to heaven. They're going to make it because of their obedience to Christ Jesus through the gospel plan of salvation. That's the way we access that grace that God gives to us. But you and I know that when, when Jesus describes the way to heaven as narrow and difficult, that's true. It's not always easy to be faithful, and that's why we have to have one another. Let me suggest to you that we absolutely need the church today. Not the church as a corporate body, though that's a way that we need it, but we need the church as individual members invested in one another, connected to one another, being that body that is described within the New Testament, that every member is important, and that every member has a role to play. This morning, if you don't feel like you have a role to play, you do. And it may not be big. It may be small. But you are important to this body at Charlotte Avenue and to the body of Christ as a whole. Let me suggest to you this morning as we close what will happen if we don't, if we aren't the church that God commands us to be. If we have no connection. Do you remember the first lesson in this series when we ran through 17 names on the screen? Uh, 
pointing out the idea of, of what if we lost just 10% of our membership of about 170? Some of those names you probably recognize. Hopefully most of those, hope, hopefully all of those names that you, you recognize. But there might have been a few because there were some that were not prominent members, people who get up front, people who lead in a whole lot of things. There may have been some of those names that you didn't recognize. Whose fault is that? More importantly, what are you going to do to fix it? If there's no connection, if there's no communion, you've heard this phrase before, how great it is to be with people of like, precious faith. How true that is. To, to, to come into a, a place where people are worshiping God according to Scripture, and you may not know them, and you may not ever get to know them, and you may never have a personal relationship with them, but you know that they are in communion with you because they are in communion with God and with His Son Jesus and with His Word, the Bible. If there's no abiding with God, if there's no abiding with Jesus, if there's no abiding with, with one another, if there's no bearing with one another with patience and with mercy, if there's no sharing the load, again in verse 2 and verse 5 of Galatians chapter 6, it says, bear one another's burdens, but then verse 5 says, but everyone must bear their own burden. That means you have a responsibility to Jesus. But sometimes I know, like you know, that burden gets too heavy, so you need help. I have a burden to carry and also have the responsibility to help you carry your burden. If we don't do that, if we don't have this connection, this communion, this bearing with one another, all of these things, if there's no correction, if we don't gently correct one another, as Galatians said, if there's no experience, older, more mature Christians, if you don't share your experience, if there's no encouragement, if, if we don't come alongside each other and spur one another on to love and good deeds, if there's no enthusiasm, young Christians, not young as in age, but young as in new, new converts, uh, the, most, the most enthusiasm often within a church is those who have just put Christ on in baptism. If we don't share that experience, if we don't come alongside each other and help each other bear no, one of those burdens, if we don't have that enthusiasm of new Christians, let me suggest to you that, that I know what's going to happen. There will be some who will be lost. Maybe not the majority. Maybe not anywhere near the majority. But what if it is just that 10%? What if it's just 17 people? Is that acceptable for us? How's it going to happen? We're going to be a threefold cord that's not easily broken because we're going to invest in one another. And let me again go back to Nelson briefly as I close. Investing in one another doesn't mean coming to Bible class, though that's important, and it gives an opportunity for us to invest in one another. Investing in one another doesn't mean coming to worship on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Bible class on Wednesday night, though all of those things are important and will give us opportunities to learn about God's Word and to invest in one another. Again, Nelson provides a perfect example. I know most of you don't know who I'm talking about, but you, you heard the words I wrote about him. He invested in people because he spent time with them. He knew their, their difficulties and he helped them. Two things. If you've got difficulties and you don't tell anybody about them, nobody can help you. So let's be honest with one another. Confess our sins to one another. Ask for help. And you don't have to do that necessarily publicly, but go to someone as a brother or sister in Christ who you trust, who you trust to be a help to you, and, 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 and confide in them so that they can invest in you. And secondly, when there are people who come forward or when there are people who tell you that they've got struggles, recognize you've got struggles too and don't judge them, simply help them. Here's the point of the whole thing. You want to go to heaven, don't you? So do I. So does everybody who's here. How are we going to make it? Through God and through helping one another. This morning, if you're not a Christian, you have that chance today because Jesus died some 2,000 years ago and rose again, never to die again. He awaits you through your obedience to the gospel plan of salvation, through faith in Him as the resurrected Son of God, repentance of your sin, confession of His name, and naming Him your Lord, and baptism where you come in contact with His blood to wash away all of your sins. You can become a part of the family, not the perfect family, but the family, the body that's traveling towards heaven. Brothers and sisters, are there, are there parts of our body that are hurting? No doubt. Let's help each other. Let's encourage one another. Let's spur one another on and help each other to get to heaven. If you have any needs, you're welcome to come, and we invite you to as we stand and sing.